Good morning, church. It's so great to see you this morning. I have a couple of announcements for you. Michael is actually up with the youth in Sweet Home this morning. They've been up there in Sweet Home, Oregon, fellowshipping, having a really good time. So pray for them. They're back here today after the service there. So be in prayer for them for safety.
Good morning, church. It's so great to see you this morning. I have a couple of announcements for you. Michael is actually up with the youth in Sweet Home this morning. They've been up there in Sweet Home, Oregon. Felt like a really good time. So pray for them. They're on their way back here today after the service there. So be in prayer for them for safety here. But that's why I'm doing announcements this morning. So First off is, thank you guys so much for being a part of Family Night last Sunday night. We were out in the front yard of the church. We had fire pits. We had s'mores. We had movies. We had kids were skateboarding, and we were playing cornhole. It was just a really good time being together. So thank you for being a part of that. Make sure to look for our next one. no way and we are the beneficiaries of that that he's provided salvation through Jesus Christ uh, the Lord's son Jesus Christ shed his blood for us that we could have eternity in heaven I was thinking about the Lord's Supper uh, this week in preparation and the idea of memorials we see memorials uh, around the country in many many different places thousands and thousands of memorials from the United States or other parts of the world. And memorials mean something to somebody. I mean, they mean something to the people that it applies to. Now, one example is Lake Shasta was going to build a dam, and they did build the dam. I understand it was completed in 1945. And they had all kinds of crews coming in to pour the cement and mix it and rebar, everything that had to go into that dam. But before they did the work, I understand there's three monuments on a hill right there by the um, Shasta Dam. And all of the work that they did was to fulfill the purpose of those monuments, those memorial pieces that were put in place. And the reason I share that is because when we come around the Lord's table to have the Lord's Supper, this is a memorial that started about 33 AD. And it has continued every first day of the week since Jesus implemented it. The other other thing that's interesting about this memorial that we're going to take place part in today the memorial was set up before the church started see what I mean is Jesus was there with his disciples and he said this is my body and then he says this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the remission of sins since the church began it maintains this continual memorial For without the giving of himself, without the giving of Jesus on the cross, there would have been no sacrifice for sins. Without the shedding of his blood, there would not be Christian followers. For his blood 
is the price for our purchase. Jesus set up this ongoing memorial for his church, for his followers. That's for us. And this memorial is built around him. His life, his death, and his resurrection. So each Sunday we participate in this special time to have this memorial of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to read one more phrase once again. We're talking about the blood of Jesus, and it says, For his blood is the price for our purchase. Jesus paid the price for us, and it cost him his life. And he willingly went to the cross to have us become his children. As we partake of the Lord's Supper today, on the chairs in front of you, you will see the communion cups. And there you'll see the loaf is in the first layer there, and then the juice is in the second layer. We're going to have a word of prayer, and then if you would join together, we'll all take communion together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do bow before you so thankful that you were willing to pay the price for us. Father, let us be those that both remember what you've done and celebrate what you've done because of the relationship that we now have with you. Father, thank you for this time where we can remember, where we can give thanks and praise. I pray your blessing on the loaf and the fruit of the vine as we remember this memorial of you at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, kids, you are dismissed to junior church. I'm sorry, Charlie, your buddy's not able to race you down there this morning. Good morning. So I want you to do, I want you to uh, real quickly to the person that is close, that is across, eh, let's not get too crazy. I know how this works. Um, the person that's either behind you or in front of you, I want everybody to stand up, if you can stand up, and just say good morning to the person around you and ask them how they're doing. <clears throat> Once you get there, you can go back to your spot, see? I already know how this works with Tyler Street. Good morning online. Good morning. Hope you are well. I think my wife is watching, maybe. What up, Elijah? What up, people in the top row? All right, all right, all right. Bring us in, bring us in, bring us in. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I know, we're done. We're done being friendly. Get back to your spot. <laughs>
How many of you guys are excited about the holidays? <laughs> we got three of you. How many forgot the holidays, I mean, are just right there? Me and Matt are like, totally. We're, we're right there. We are right there. You gotta, I mean, if you didn't get a turkey yet, you're in trouble. Um, I don't know if you know, there's a national turkey shortage. So if you need a turkey, get one. And then with new California laws, we're not going to get crazy, but it's going to be really hard to get bacon here soon. So make sure to stock up on your bacon. The holidays right around the corner. Um, not only holidays, and some of us are excited, some of us are, I don't really care. How many of you guys, I, I know, how many of you have started decorating your house? Yeah, I know there was a couple of you guys here. I knew there was. Christian and I were riding in the truck today, uh, this week, and he goes, I am married to a woman that wants to decorate at the 1st of November. Can you believe that? I know. Poor soul out of all the things. <laughs> is there things that you have to do during the holiday season? Is there things that you, I mean, like, it is tradition. This is what we do during the season. You have, like, I already know what's going to happen is, is right after Thanksgiving, because I'm normal, I'm going to get up on my roof and almost kill myself by putting those lights up because my kids love them. And then I think we even bought like some inflatable dinosaurs with uh, Christmas hats. So my, so like it's, and it's literally, you think it's for the community. It is for my kids. That's it. So we decorate the house. Not only that, that's what's really neat where we're at. We can walk about, I don't know, a quarter of a mile. And there's one of those courts where the whole court goes bananas. And they like, the electricity bill is a million dollars and they've got everything decorated to the night. And my kids, we walk it. So they're all bundled up looking like Ralphie on, uh, on the Christmas story. And they love it. So we do that every, and we're going to do it like 18 times. We're going to do it a ton of times. We just always do it. Cody used to watch the Thanksgiving Day Parade every year. And then the Lord brought me into our life. And we don't do that anymore because the fact that's just lame. I don't watch the Thanksgiving Day. Did somebody watch the Thanksgiving Day Parade? Yeah, I just, you do? Oh, it's recorded. No, see, I'm just, see, there's things that we do, right? Some of you guys are like, oh, no, every Thanksgiving, if we don't have this dish, it's not Thanksgiving. Period. Period. See? See, isn't that weird? If there's no football on, if we're not, if all three games, we don't even have to watch them. But the games need to be on in the background to watch the Cowboys lose. Like, that's just what we do. <laughs> listen, 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 I know, I know. And there's a reason for all this this morning. There's a reason. You guys are like, what is he doing? See, we all know this is coming up, but it goes fast. Thanksgiving is coming. That's not my sermon. Uh, Thanksgiving is coming, and after Thanksgiving's coming, do I just need to keep going? Let me see, let me see. Oh, no. Hey, I got it, Alyssa, you're good. Now, if you want to know what Bob preached about last week, there it is. Um, but there's a, there's a, there's a stream of things coming on, and for some of you, it's a big deal. For some of you, it's not. And for some of us, it's just a whirlwind. Like, where are we doing Thanksgiving? And then after Thanksgiving, there's going to be a couple weeks till Christmas, and then we got all to get, get the Christmas stuff done, and then what in the world are we doing for New Year's? And then after New Year's, boom, it's February 3rd, right? It just flies. And in a church, like, I'll, I'll, I'll pull back the curtain a little bit. For church planning, like, we know, okay, October, we're going to do Mission Awareness Month. And then right after Mission Awareness Month, we're going to do something around giving. And then, of course, we're going to do something on Thanksgiving. And then after Thanksgiving, we're going to prep up for the, the Christmas. And then we got the big Christmas party. And then this year's a blast because Christmas is on Sunday. Let me remind you. And then, so we got to figure out how to do that. And then after that, New Year's is on a Sunday, so you guys will all be bright-eyed, bushy-tailed in here, and then after that, our online stream just shot through the roof on New Year's, like, it's going to have 800 viewers online, right, but after that, and then it just keeps going, like, we already know from a planning leadership perspective, this is just gone, like, it's, it's, it's gone, we're already, we don't even talk about it, we're looking at, and I am excited about the new year, Bob and I, the elders, Michael, Mike Makita, some of the, we have already started putting things together, I know junior church has already put things together, the ministries are, we're excited about it, and by about January 18th, you guys are going to see a, oh, that's what we're doing, and I'm, I'm excited about it, I'm excited about it, so you should be excited about it, so let me ask you, do you go into autopilot this season? Do you go into autopilot? I love flying. I love flying. 
I wish I had more than more time to be able to get my private pilot's license and be up in the air flying. I have friends that have it here, and we go. I love flying, but I go flying with people that I trust. <laughs> I don't want them going into idle pilot, right? But in this season of life, a lot of us can just go into an autopilot. We can go into autopilot in our church planning. We're like, look, the church already knows what's happening, so let's just, let's just do what we already know is going to happen. Autopilot can be really good. Autopilot, when you need to get stuff done, you're like, look, we got to get stuff done. Go into autopilot mode. Nope, one foot in front of the other. We're just getting this done. When you don't want to think about it, we go into autopilot mode. Listen, I know I got to do this job. I know I just got to get through this, so I'll engage autopilot. I know I have to do this task. There's no way around it. Autopilot. I know I have to have this conversation, and I'm not looking forward to this conversation. Autopilot. I know I have to go to this person's house, and I have to eat this fruitcake or whatever. <laughs> autopilot. And you just go into autopilot. You don't, you're like, are you enjoying yourself? Nah. Do you want to do it? Nah. What are you doing? You're just one foot in front of the other. You're in autopilot. And maybe that isn't always how it goes, but maybe you're th sitting there thinking and you go, man, maybe autopilot does have a dark side. Like I said, autopilot isn't necessarily bad, but autopilot can take over. When you get overwhelmed, go into autopilot. When you make a conscious or unconscious decision to just check out, you're going to check out of your family time. You're going to check out of uh, being involved in church things. You're going to check out and dealing with an issue. You're just like, I'm not even, I'm just going to go into autopilot and not even think about it. Maybe when you get really, really anxious about things, you go into autopilot. When you don't have answers, when you've lost interest, and we can put our lives into autopilot. And where I would say, check yourself if you might be in autopilot, is when you're in autopilot, Time just, you don't even know where it went. You, were un, you might have been unintentional with your time, and you're like, what did we, how did I, did I? Well, you just went into autopilot. So the important things in life, the relational things in life, usually don't go well when we're in autopilot. Relationships do not grow in autopilot. Relationships will either stay this way, or they'll start to go down because someone will feel frustrated that you're not engaged. You're not here. I don't know where you are. Well, I'm in autopilot. I'm going over there. My wife says that my autopilot <laughs> looks like um, leaf blowing leaves in the attic. <laughs> I'm doing a task that is totally not necessary. The house is on fire. The kids are screaming. Elijah's attached to the ceiling. And I'm like, babe, I need to go reorganize the screws. So I'll be back. <laughs> and, and some of you wives are like, amen, amen, amen. See, that's autopilot for me. I'm like, well, this seems really important right now. Or I've got things going on in my heart and in my mind that I just don't want to deal with. And I just, I'm kind of closing every, I'm pushing things out. I want to go into autopilot. I'm an autopilot person. I'm a systems person. I like things to continue going the way they go. But when I get into that rut... It can be sometimes really hard to get a hold of me, to get my attention. I think any and all of the earlier followers of Jesus, in their relationships with Jesus, in their growth with Jesus, and letting the Holy Spirit work and move and drive their lives, autopilot was never an option. It was never an option. Jesus was always helping them see things differently. You have heard it said, now I say, Oh, you've seen it done this way. Now you're going to do it this way. You're going to think differently. You're going to do things differently. You're going to help others see things differently and do things differently. And I think Jesus and the Holy Spirit is doing the same thing with us. Is it's calling us out of doing the same old, same old, calling us out of your autopilotness. That's a word. And having us see things and do things different. See, I think we were meant to live a life, and you guys have heard us say it so many times. See, it looks like this. Whoever believes in me, this is Jesus speaking, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. That's not autopilot. That's joy. That's life. That's, that's boom. But see, here's what we want to watch out for. When autopilot looks like auto give up. 
when we're just like, I'm out. This scripture is not auto give up and it's not autopilot. This is allowing the Holy Spirit to work and move in your life. This is saying, okay, it's not all about me. I know God and the Holy Spirit is working and moving. How can I join in it? How can I follow Jesus and what he's doing? See, because God's working, amen? God is working in and around all of you. But it's a lot of times we're just in this mode. And we've got the blinders on and we're just like, get to point B. I got a, a, an amazing, and I didn't even think about sharing it this morning, but I had God just, whoa, bam, me with God on my autopilot this week with Mike Makita, Michael Doherty, and Bob. And I want to know, we'll see if they remember. But I mean, the Lord just said, wake up, Jordan. And it's because he was calling out of being an autopilot. But see, a life that can be described as rich, full, meaningful, a life marked by growing intentionally, that's not autopilot. We do not grow unintentionally. We grow intentionally. We put ourselves at the foot of the cross. We put ourselves into Jesus and the uncomfortability of that. And we say, okay, Lord, you've got the controls now. And that is terrifying. It's scary. You had a verse this week. You had a verse this week. And if you're not on the daily reading, if you're not the daily, weekly reading list, um, go talk to Everett. It's just a text message. Ding, and it says, hey, this is what we're reading this week. It's great. I love it. And if you're not a part of it, Get a part of it because that's what we're talking about this morning. So get your Bibles, get your phones, open up 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1, almost all the way in the back. If you're on your phone, it's almost all the way at the bottom. The things you got to prep for nowadays. 2 Peter 1, 3. And of course, I put it on the screen. 2 Peter 1, 3, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that, though, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, or faithfulness, your version might say, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours, church, and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a powerful phrase. Keep reading. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgot forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. You'll never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them and are established in truth that you may have, that you have, I think it is right as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder. That is a powerful phrase. Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, as we read and continue to just dive into these few passages, God, I pray that we wouldn't be ineffective and unfruitful. God, that we would be a church, we'd be a people, we'd be a family, we'd be a friend, we'd be a husband and a wife, God, that would be effective and fruitful and know how you've called us to live, God. Help us to stay out of autopilot as we even go through this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Jesus has given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. You've got it all. It's all there for us. But did you catch what it said? If you look at the very beginning, it says, through the true knowledge of Jesus, do you want that? Do you want the true knowledge of Jesus? Are you willing to let go of what you believe real life is and let Jesus have control? I mean, amen. But listen, if you don't want it, 
And if you don't know if you want this life, let me help you. Let me help you, okay? You do. You really do want this life. You want a life that looks like bursting waters. You want a life that looks like life and where you, you're not even doing it for other people, but other people can see that there's things different about us where you go, no, I've got a hope. See, and that's the problem with the prosperity gospel. Well, we'll dive this way a little bit. Is the problem is, is that each and every one of you, if you haven't yet, are going to run into brokenness. And you are going to run into hurt, and you're going to run into pain, and you're going to run into loss because the world is broken, and sin is rampant. And if we are not living the true knowledge of Jesus, if we're not being built in that, brokenness is going to come like a jackhammer, and it's not going to let up. I've experienced brokenness. Some of you have experienced brokenness. Some of you haven't yet. I mean, real brokenness, where things have been taken that is just not fair. We run into these things. And see, growing in our knowledge of Jesus, growing in the power of the Holy Spirit, we are equipped to deal with these things. We are able to go through the unanswerable questions. But it does not happen in autopilot. It doesn't happen in that. We want that life because it's real life. It's not fake life. It's not a life that's on social media and it's only cute on there. That's not it. And we want a life that when we look back over the years, when you look back over the year, you say, man, God was faithful, God was faithful, God was faithful. Not, I did a good job, I did a good job, I did a good job. And the reason I made it through that is because of me. That's not how I want to live my life. I want to see the power of God work and move in, through me, and around me. But if we want this life, if we want to not be sidetracked by the world and by the things that overpromise and never deliver, right? Yeah. Man, you get this. Your life is going to be so much better. If that 401k was right here, man, you would feel if you could just, and if there's always something else, right? It overpromises and never delivers the world. See, if we want a life past that, Peter is going to give us some actionable things. I learned that from my, one of my elder people, one of my elders, Mike Stanley. We need actionable things. Right? And I, I'm agreeing with that. I love that. So here's Peter helping us see where we can grow. Are you ready? Supplement your faith. Add to your faith in Jesus these things. Well, perfect. He's, even, he's given it to us. Virtue. Add to your faith. Virtue with knowledge. Virtue is defined as conformity to a standard of right, a morality, a particular moral excellence. So supplement your faith with virtue. So do you have a real faith in Jesus? What has to come along and, and has come alongside with this correct, this right way of living? See, I think a lot of times, I'm not going to steal from the new year because I got a phrase, but I'm going to put it off for like two months. No, no, no. See, we, we'll, we'll say that we believe but are we, are we making the doing part conform to how Jesus says, this is how you do things? Or are we saying we believe, but really we're doing things how we want to do things? See, see, Peter says, no, 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 you've got to take this faith that you have in Jesus and then this virtue, this conformity to how Jesus says, this is how you live out your faith. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated. So this virtue, so we are called to ask ourselves the questions, are we conforming our life and our morals and our standards to what the world says or what, to what Jesus says? Or maybe not the world. Are we conforming our way of living, our way of doing things to what we want to do or what Jesus says? Well, how do I know how to do that, Jordan? Well, right here, virtue with knowledge of Jesus. So then you add virtue with knowledge. How do you figure out what the right standard of living is? You ever just, and I know these are, this, this is a little bit heady. It's a little bit up there, and you've got to drink another swig of coffee. But how do you figure out what the right way is? What says right is right and wrong is wrong? The Bible. Okay, I'm down. So are you just going to trust everything that I say? This is what the Bible says. And trust everything that Bob says? And trust everything, I mean, Man, I'm even, I don't know how long I've been, I've been with Jesus a minute. Wow. Almost 20 years, almost 20 years. I've been a follower of Jesus. I was raised in the church. 
And even now, I think about and I question, and I go, man, would I be here if I was not raised in it? And it's a blessing that I was raised in it, but do I know enough of the word to where, no, 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 if I was to just throw everything out the window and I was just to start with the Bible, would I get to where I am? Hmm. I'm, I don't know. <laughs> Come on. See, where are you getting your knowledge of Jesus? Was the last time that you excelled in your knowledge of Jesus 20 years ago? At a rally at Park Creek, at a conference, at a, there was a really good sermon by a preacher that I don't remember. Like, when was the last time that your knowledge of Jesus expanded? And you were like, he's so much bigger and greater than anything I could ever imagine. See, that moment, there's always another bridge. There's always another mountain. There's always, you know, when you're hiking and you get to, you're like, oh, I'm going to get to the top of this mountain. And you're like, oh, there's another top. See, that's what it is with Jesus. There's always more with Jesus. There's always more. So the question is, are you increasing in virtue with knowledge? Well, in order to gain knowledge, what do you got to do? You got to learn. You got to be taught. Hmm. That requires learning. Can we learn and retain our knowledge of who Jesus is and live in autopilot? Because what you're probably going to have to do is change some things that you're doing as your knowledge of Jesus and what he wants you to do with your life increases. With virtue, this moral excellence changes. This compass of right and wrong, as that changes with the knowledge of Jesus, you're going to have to change some things. What are, you going, what are you doing to grow in knowledge? What are you doing to grow? See, I, uh, that, that is sometimes... We think that just, you know, a 45-minute sermon on Sunday can get it done. And, man, you guys have a lot of faith in Bob and Jordan and the elders. <laughs> we got to have more than that. You've got to be in the Word. You've got to be daily praying and thinking and surrounding yourself with God. Because if not, there's, there's room for Satan, for the world, for ourselves to break it. But let's keep going. So knowledge, so virtue, so supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control. And the church said, amen. <laughs> we love self-control. No. <laughs> self-control, the ability to tell yourself, no. You have, is there anything wrong with it? Nope. Is there anything that is morally wrong? No. Should you, can you do it? Yep. But are you going to do it? No. Because you are in control of yourself. And you're letting this virtue with knowledge and this new knowledge dictate to tell you, self, we're not doing this. We're not spending our money this way. We're not living our life this way. It's a weird conversation with yourself, I know. But you're saying, self, Jordan, we're going to aim ourselves towards Jesus and this knowledge of Jesus, and that's how we're going to live. And we're going to sacrifice things that Jordan would want to do for the sake of the gospel and what Jesus would want. For the sake of people. For the sake of my church. For the sake of things that, not, maybe not necessarily wrong, but I'm saying, no, I am following after Jesus. Can we say no to ourselves? Self-control, self-discipline. Are you able to have an urge, a desire, something rise up within you, and you are able to tell yourself, no, we're not going to do that today. So, knowledge with self-control. Can we do that? Can we supplement our faith with knowledge and self-control? Can we supplement self-control with steadfastness and faithfulness? Jordan, this list is not getting easier. This isn't getting easier. Are you able to be self-disciplined for a long time? Are you able to be disciplined for, oh, for longer than 24 hours? Man. Self-discipline with faithfulness, with steadfastness. We're adding this all to our faith. And then steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. Is there things that we can add to our faith from this little passage here? <laughs> There's some things there. There's some things that we can add. And man, we could say, Peter, you're not making this easy, bud. You're not making this easy. Well, this is a lifestyle not on autopilot. That's what that is. It's a lifestyle of following Jesus. Autopilot has us going through the motions of living, but at the end of the day, we realize we are mostly ineffective and unfruitful in autopilot. 
of ineffective and unfruitful. If we are growing in these things, we are slowly, steadily dying to ourselves and being raised to Jesus. Autopilot might have us believing something, but the question is, is does it have us doing things? Does it have us doing? Does it have us being things? And autopilot comes up short. In order for us to do and be, it has to be following Jesus and all forces in that direction. Then you got this. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This, Peter is calling us to a higher standard of living. If we're living this life of being an autopilot, we are living a life where we are so nearsighted that we've forgotten who we are, what Jesus has done, and the direction that we're living our lives. And that has us being unfruitful and ineffective. But sometimes, sometimes we accept the lies that being okay is okay. And to a degree it is. To a degree, man, we all get knocked down. We all get our, we all get a right hook to the jaw, metaphorically speaking, or maybe really. And that's why when we're... The, <laughs> When you're walking and you're going in that direction and you see a friend and you see a brother or sister, the, the, the most important part, not the most important part, but it's such an important part, is when you're out of autopilot, your eyes open and you can see someone that's in the dust. And you can see someone that's hurting and you can see someone that's broken. And you can say, hey, let me help you pick you up. Remember what we're doing here. Remember where we're going. Because in autopilot, I'm just getting from A to B. This part. Whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was clean, cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, brothers and sisters, church, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and your election. If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The mindset is, I am not living for myself, but for Jesus. And that Jesus is leading me to good and for good because Jesus loves me. See, I am not, Jordan is not living for Jordan, but for Jesus. And that Jesus is leading Jordan to good and for good because Jesus loves Jordan. See, that you have to believe and live out. You can't just say it. And I can't give a blanket statement as why you are where you are. Like, I can't, I can't say, like, hey, this statement is for everybody. That is why I trust that you are working out your own salvation. That's why I trust that you are in the scriptures, that you're coming closer and you're drawing closer to Jesus. But I can't get you where you are in your life, in theology, or the theology of why you think the way you think. But some of us have preconceived ideas and thoughts that we try to force Jesus into. And it really damages our outlook on Jesus. And whether that's in a really negative way or in a way too hyper positive, Jesus is a big Santa Claus way. Whatever way that is. Every, I don't want to lose you here. Some of us have heard verses. Some of us have heard this stuff, these verses that we've read. And you've looked at other, how other Christians have lived. And you've gone, I guess I'm meant to live in a box and on nothing. I guess I'm not allowed to have nice things. I guess I have to quit my job. Some of you guys heard, some of you guys might have heard our uh, sermon series through money, or you've heard our sermon series through uh, giving, and you're like, man, I guess what Bob's telling me is I got to sell everything and abandon my family and go preach for the Lord. I really don't, I don't know what to do here. And so we get discouraged and we pull back. Some of us, I guess I have to ignore my family now. I guess that's what the Lord's calling me to do. I guess I can't enjoy things because Jordan says, I'm not supposed to say yes to myself. I guess I have to be miserable. And a lot of Christians have fallen into this weird space of where they know the right thing to do, but they looks awful. And they don't know what to do. 
And see, here's the thing. Those things right there don't sound like good news to me. They don't sound like good news to me. And that's certainly not the vision of good news that Jesus came to share with the world. But when we're trying to ride the fence of what the world says is good and what Jesus says is good, and we're trying to ride that fence, it is miserable. It's miserable. And autopilot sticks us right there because we can't be completely honest with ourselves, but the things that we think will make us happy and things that we think will bring us life, it looks really good. It looks really good. Jesus isn't saying those things, but here's the truth. The world, listen to me, the world might be telling you that following Jesus is miserable and you hook, line, and sinker. And sadly, you might even have a few well-meaning Christians suggesting that with how we live our lives. The world might have influenced your thinking enough for you to believe that following Jesus is going to make you miserable, but we really don't want to go to hell. But we really don't want to go to hell. So, what do we do? We go into autopilot. Because we're not increasing in our knowledge. We're not increasing with the brothers and sisters in Jesus. We're not pushing ourselves to try to figure out what Jesus would call for our lives. But we know we don't want to go to that place. So, we go into autopilot. And we don't stick on this vision. The mindset of I'm not living for myself, but for Jesus, and that Jesus is leading me to good and for good because Jesus loves me. The world tells you that Jesus is not that. Jesus is not leading you to good. Jesus is not going to do good. Jesus has a bigger agenda than you, and he does have a bigger agenda than us, but Jesus knows you by name. Jesus knows the hairs on your head. Jesus knows who you are going to be before you were formed in your mother's womb. Jesus has a plan for each one of us. Don't accept Worldly thinking as godly thinking. Don't slip into autopilot with your walk with Jesus. We do this in our church walk. We do this when we go on Sunday mornings. We can slip into autopilot. We go, okay, what are we going to do? We're going to go sing the songs. Okay, here's the songs that he's going to sing. Okay, and then we know after four songs what comes. Communion, and then after communion, someone's going to get up, and they're going to talk. Okay, now Jordan's going to speak. Da-da-da-da-da. Oh, they're bringing growth groups back and going deeper, so then they want me to stay for that. And then you're just going through the motions here. Just get it done, and then I'll be back next Sunday. Some of us might say, oh, I've done a lot of things in the past that have gotten me closer with Jesus, but now I don't know why I'm not like I was then. Maybe you've slipped into autopilot. Maybe you've slipped into autopilot. I can't figure out why I'm not seeing growth, why I'm not feeling this way or thinking this way, or why you might have slipped into autopilot where things are just going the way they're going and you've blocked out Jesus from trying to get a hold of you. Here's the deal. (laughs) When we come together to worship, when we come together to take communion, when we open up God's word, we're looking to become more like Jesus. When we pray, We're praying for Jesus to come and fill this space so that way our hearts can be pulled more towards him. That way when we open this word, that we wouldn't be more like ourselves, but we become more like Jesus. We're not just filling time here. But so many times, guys, we have to step outside of ourselves, and when we come together, we're like, what is Jesus going to do in this place today? What is Jesus going to do in me today? When I sing the song, Walking Around These Walls, I thought by now they'd fall, though you have never failed me yet. Have you ever thought about that in your own life? When you say, oh, we believe in God, in Jesus, the Holy Spirit, we believe in the resurrection, are you going, okay, what does that look like in my life? What does that look like in my life? When Stuart talks about a memorial and communion, what is Jesus trying to communicate with me here, right now? See, I'm just letting you know, church, The Holy Spirit's trying to get a hold of you right now in some way, shape, or form. He's trying to get a hold of you. But the question is, are you listening? Are you looking? Are you just waiting for it to go about another five more minutes, and then we got lunchtime? Or going deeper, which we should be at. You are coming here to participate. We are living this life to do something. 
You are part of a body. You are part of a team. You are part of a church. You are a part of something so much bigger than just here at Tyler Street. And that's the beauty of Mission Month, to remind us, oh, yeah, there are things going on on the completely other end of the world. And I'm a part of that. My faith is a part of that. See, I'm not living for myself, but for Jesus. Now, Jesus is leading me to good, for good, because Jesus loves me. So then this ends with this. Therefore, I intend to always remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in truth that you have, have. I think it right as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder. Peter says, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to keep telling you, church, to keep working on these things. As long as there's breath for me to draw, I'm going to remind you of these things. And that's what I'm doing here this morning. I want to remind you, supplement your faith with these things. Step out of autopilot. I always want to remind you that there is more to this life than what is right in front of us. I don't want us to stay nearsighted. I don't want us to become blind by all the things that the world throws at us. Jesus is calling to be more and to do more. Jesus is calling us to life. Don't slip into autopilot. Don't just show up for church. Be the church. And if you don't know what that is, talk to somebody about what is that. What is Jesus calling me to? Don't settle for high bye relationships. Hi bye. How are you doing? Oh, I'm good. Bye. And that's the deepest relationship that you have in church? No. Reach out to someone. Here's something crazy. Have them over for dinner. Or go out to Taco Bell. Maybe, maybe that's better. I don't know. But connect with people. Put yourself out there. And listen, if you're only doing it for yourself and what you can get out of it, you're not going to get anything out of it. But if you're going to serve, hey, there's somebody in the church that I'm going to serve, and maybe I'm just going to be a shoulder for them to lean on. Maybe I'm going to find out that they're going through things that I had no clue, and I can totally step into this. Don't start relationships just to see what you can get out of it because you won't get anything out of it. Maybe... I had a friend say recently, after this whole COVID thing and after we were apart, they were like, man, we were, we were so tight and we say we're tight and we're not. We haven't gotten together and done things for a year, year and a half. We haven't communicated well in a year. We haven't, we haven't been together and man, but because we slipped into autopilot, relationships just kind of staggered. They went away. Don't settle for that. Jesus is calling us to more and be more. So for you, is it virtue with knowledge? Is your faith need to be supplemented with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love? There's probably something there for each one of us. There's probably something there for us. Jesus is calling all of us out of autopilot. He's calling you out of autopilot right now. Jesus called me out of autopilot this week. Let me tell you what happened. Um, it has been a rough week for the Loader household, and not in a minor sense. It has been probably for health things, it has been the worst week that we've ever had in my existence. It's been insane. Um, but there's still stuff that has to get done, right? So you're up all night, you're helping kids, you're doing that, and poor wife has to deal with so many things. But then I have to go, and I'm doing meetings and things like that, and I tell on the leadership, hey, if you guys could pray for Bo and what he's going through right now. So they pray for it. And then um, Mike, Makita, Bob, Michael, and myself, we go out to lunch on, Tuesday, on Wednesday. And as we go out to lunch, we get done talking about, you know, random things. And I just felt urged to say it again. And I was like, hey, guys, just through your walk, just through your walk this week, just pray for Bo. He really needs it this week. And so they say, okay, yep, no problem. And then Bob, because, you know, he's a spiritually minded man. What does Bob do? Bob's like, well, we're in the parking lot of the Lord's Chicken, Chick-fil-A. So let's pray. Let's just pray right now. How many of you guys, when people say, let's just pray right now, you're like, okay, okay. And then you're like, okay. And, but you're just like, man, people are going to see. This is awkward. But you, you, you surround yourself. And so these four people come up, um, Bob, Mike, Mike, Bob, Michael. And we're sitting like this, and Bob starts with prayer. And Bob, man, he does this thing. And if you haven't prayed with him in a while, just, just try it. He'll do this thing where he won't say Jesus' name, amen, because he wants the prayer to keep going. So he's like, Lord, and that's what we put before you. 
Well, one of you guys start praying for crying out loud. <laughs> so he is. He's calling. Hey, what's the Lord putting on your heart right now? So then Mike Makita starts praying. And Mike's praying. He's praying for Bo. He's praying for God to work and move. It's so much bigger than that. And all of a sudden, I start hearing footsteps behind me. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't know what's going on. And then I see a pair of shoes. And it gets right there, and it stops. And you know what you're thinking. You're like, this guy or this girl, whoever sees this right now, is like, what are these dudes doing right here? And the footsteps start coming towards us. And the footsteps come in the circle. And I look up, and he goes, can I pray with you? I, man, just, <clears throat> and I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. So Mike just keeps praying, and then it gets to me, and I start praying, and I'm like, uh, and so I, I, I pray, I, you know, you're caught off guard and you're praying, you're praying for Bo, you're praying for the guys in this group, you're praying for the people that you know and you don't know, and you're like, and then I end the prayer, right? I end the prayer and I say, I say the magic words, Jesus' name, amen, right? And so we look up and we look at him and he goes, oh, can I pray too? So he prays for the, see, if I wasn't vulnerable enough for 30 seconds to say, hey, guys, can you pray for my son this week? And then if another brother, another Christian wasn't vulnerable enough to say, hey, why don't we just pray right now? And then if some dude that I don't even know was vulnerable enough to walk by these random people and say, hey, can I, can I pray with you guys? Obviously, that's what you're doing. I, I don't know Jeffrey. That's his name, I think. I don't know who he is. But somehow, he had taken the blinders off of autopilot for a few moments to pray with a group of Christians and to pray with a dad that really needed it right there. I don't know if I'm ever going to see him again. But if something didn't smack me out of autopilot so fast, it was that moment right there. Man, let God dwell in your hearts richly. See, I could win probably a lot of money, but the, the amount of life that I felt right there it was a whirlwind. It was insane. I won't tell you which guy had big, giant alligator tears in his eyes, but because it was probably all of us. We were just moved that God worked to just remind you, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's things I'm working way bigger than what you're seeing right in front of you. But church, you got to step out of autopilot. You got to you got to step out of autopilot. Say something. Put yourself in, an, in a situation. Ian, for the worship team, has just finally figured out that he can read books. So now he's making the whole worship team read books. And he is jacked. And there's people in the worship team that don't want to read books. But he's making them do it. Why? Because he put himself in a situation beyond that. You, the Lord can do things in you that you have no idea how high you could fly, as Michael Scott would say. Thank you, church. Thank you. The question is, where are you in autopilot? And where is Jesus trying to call you out of it? I encourage you to stick around this morning. Stick around for the conversation of staying out of autopilot, that ever it's going to leave and going deeper. And then we are, just so you guys know, starting in January, we are going to be bringing back growth groups, different individual growth groups here. So please prepare yourselves for that. Know that that schedule is coming. There's three different groups going to be started that we are very excited about. That is a way of getting you out of autopilot. That is a way. But don't just start in January. Maybe invite somebody over this week. Maybe do something. I don't know. I put enough out there, church. Thank you so much. Let's be standing. We're going to end with a word of prayer. Um, I'm going to pray also over the offering, which you can remember is in the back, or you can do it online on our website, the Tithely app, and then be in prayer for the youth group as they come back from Sweet Home, okay? Thank you, Jordan. Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, you are good. You do good, God. You love us, you care for us, you have a plan for us, God. I pray that we would open ourselves to you, we would be vulnerable enough, God, to reach out to somebody. Maybe we're the ones hurting, maybe we don't know how to get out of this rut. Lord, I just pray that for each person in your church, that they wouldn't live a life, especially during these holiday seasons, in autopilot. God, be with us now. Help us not to live autopilot with our kids, don't be an autopilot with our wives, with our friends, with you, God. Just wreck our thinking and fill us up with you. God, I'm so thankful for the church, so thankful for what you do. Be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. You are dismissed. No music.
Good morning, church. It's so great to see you this morning. I have a couple of announcements for you. Michael is actually up with the youth in Sweet Home this morning. They've been up there in Sweet Home, Oregon, fellowshipping, having a really good time. So pray for them. They're on their way back here today after the service there. So be in prayer for them for safety here. But that's why I'm doing announcements this morning. So First off is, thank you guys so much for being a part of Family Night last Sunday night. We were out in the front yard of the church. We had fire pits. We had s'mores. We had movies. We had kids were skateboarding, and we were playing cornhole. It was just a really good time being together. So thank you for being a part.